reincarnated with the strongest system. Chapter 631, Heroes of Valhalla Ain Herjar The Ain Herjars are the elite warriors chosen by Odin, and blessed by the goddess Freya. They are handpicked among the brave warriors that the Valkyries have taken to Valhalla in order to protect the Nine Realms, and fight those who threaten its peace. They are the warriors who stood above others, and were the pinnacle of mankind. Once they received the blessing, their bodies were reformed and strengthened, until they could be born anew as Ain Herjars. They are the last line of defense against the prophecy of Ragnarok, where the fate of the Nine Realms will be decided. Prestige Class Unique Skill, Heroes of Valhalla Prestige Class Unique Skill, World and Tempest Prestige Class Unique Bonus, Receives Plus 100 Enhancement Bonus to All Stats Unlocked Title, Army of One Unlocked Title, Jack of All Trades, Incomplete Version Unlocked Title, One Who Breaks the Rules Army of One Plus 50 Enhancement Bonus to All Stats Jack of All Trades, Incomplete Version Receives Plus 150 Enhancement Bonus to All Stats One Who Breaks the Rules The Einjurjar can forcefully break the rules of any plane of existence as long as he is willing to pay the price for it. Each time the Ain Herjar uses this power, he will lose a random memory from his previous life. The more powerful the rule, the more memories will be erased, never to return again. Belial snorted in disdain. It had been hundreds of years since someone had dared to challenge him openly. All those who did had already been dealt with, and transformed into one of the monstrosities that were present inside the Devil's Floor. For him, William was just one of those stupid mortals who thought that they could challenge the authority of one of the guardians that ruled a floor in the Tower of Babylon. In the Hall of Guardians, Cod, Oogwe, Eve, Jelly Bell, and the other guardians from the first up to the fiftieth floor were watching the events that were unfolding at the fifty-first floor. Jelly Bell had planted a miniature piece of itself in William's body, allowing it to see everything on the mysterious floor that they had no idea about. They had seen William fight the Yerim Mawyhahus, and the other beasts in the maze. For the first time in a thousand years, they had seen what the devil floor was like and the guardian that resided on it. Even though Cod had grudges with William, he didn't like the fact that a guardian had done the taboo. Instead of giving the players a chance to clear his floor, Belial prevented anyone from conquering his domain. The renegade guardian even resorted to eating their hearts, which made the other guardians look at him in contempt. So, this is why no one has cleared the 51st floor in the last thousand years. Oogwe sighed. This is simply tyranny. The other guardians nodded their heads in agreement. They knew full well that no one could beat a guardian on its own floor, even if the challenger was a demigod. They could only watch the silver-haired teenage boy with pity, because there was no way for him to beat Belial, who was the reigning god of the 51st floor. Belial pointed his hand at William and sneered. Kill him, Belial ordered. I have no need for his heart. All of you can have it. The guardian of the 51st floor then stared at the priestess, hinting her to continue the wedding ceremony. The old woman wanted to protest because she had already claimed William for herself, but against Belial's orders, her voice carried little power. She could only sigh in her heart and curse William for being stupid. You should have just allowed yourself to become my toy. At least you will be alive. The old woman lamented. Such a waste. I guess I will have to settle for another toy when we are freed from this tower. Hundreds of Yerim who's lunged at William with bloodshot eyes. Since their master had given his order, they would definitely carry it out without fail. William ignored these little vampires and hurled Solile towards Belial who had already turned his back on him. After throwing his spear, he raised Stormacala and zapped the living daylights of the obnoxious, creepy vampires that had once scared Chiffon out of her wits. So Lyle flew straight and true, leaving a blazing trail in its wake. However, when it was only a meter away from Belial's head, it stopped completely as if it had come across an invisible barrier. True marriage is more than joining the bonds of marriage of two persons, the priestess said as she read the book in her hand. 
It is the union of two hearts. It lives on the love you give each other and never grows old, but thrives on the joy of each new day. Belial laughed internally. He was merely going through the motions of the wedding in order to make Chiffon's heart bloom fully. He didn't care about the nonsense of the union of two hearts, he was someone who ate people's hearts. He once again glanced at his young bride, and the pink flower whose radiance was steadily increasing. Letting the final wishes of those that had succumbed to the heart devil be fulfilled brought out the greatest power in their hearts. It was the power that Belial wished to acquire, so he was willing to play his part, and become the groom of the pitiful girl, who wished to marry the person she loved. The priestess was about to say more, but her words were once again interrupted when Belial's body was kicked off from the top of the pyramid by the silver-haired half-elf that had materialized behind him. Belial quickly regained his balance as he floated in the air. He then narrowed his eyes as he looked at William with a serious expression. The Guardian didn't know how the irritating teenager managed to break through the barrier he had erected. This barrier was made from the laws of his domain. No ordinary being would be able to simply ignore the rules that he had set beforehand. Only a demigod was able to do this, and clearly, the boy in front of him was not one. William didn't have time to glance at his status page because of the situation at hand. If he had time, he would be surprised to see his current stats were boosted by his shepherd skill, heroism. Ain Herjar. Name, William von Ainsworth. Race, half-elf. Health points, 365,100 slash 365,100. Mana. 396,600 slash 396,600. Job class, Quick Shot Shepherd, level 30. Sub class, Ain Herjar, level 20. Strength, 258, plus 972. Agility, 275, plus 997. Vitality, 254 plus 966. Intelligence, 295, plus 1027. Dexterity, 315, plus 1058. Right now, William's stats had boosted him into the initial stages of the saint rank. This was good news for him because he wasn't able to use his heroic avatar skill because a week hadn't passed since he last used it. What you're doing is futile. Belial sneered. No matter what you do, you won't win. If you kneel before me, I will show mercy on you and make you one of my generals. This is your final chance to keep your pitiful life, mongrel. William ignored the guardian's words and stood as straight as a sword. So Lyle and Stormacaller floated above his head like bodyguards that were waiting for the order of their master. With just a thought, the two sentient weapons would immediately take action, and raise the surroundings in a rain of fire and lightning. Heroes of Valhalla, William said and activated the Ain Herjar's unique skill. Immediately thirteen perfect clones of William appeared behind him. Each of these clones were as strong as William, and was able to use all of the abilities he possessed. One of the clones grabbed Stormacaller, and another one held Solile. Rongominiad flew out of the gem on William's chest and landed in the hands of another clone. Optimus, do it, William ordered. I don't care how much it costs. Just do it. Understood. Purchasing all the weapons from the god shop. Longinus successfully bought for 200,000 god points. Chris Alakatos successfully bought for 200,000 god points. Gungnir successfully bought for 200,000 god points. Gabulk successfully bought for 200,000 god points. Caliban successfully bought for 200,000 god points. Grail Sword successfully bought for 200,000 god points. Galatine successfully bought for 200,000 god points. Arendite successfully bought for 200,000 god points. Kurek House successfully bought for 200,000 god points. Clarence successfully bought for 200,000 god points. The weapons that William had bought all landed in the hands of his clones. 
These were the weapons that were part of his lightning god war art that he hadn't used in the past because his strength was not enough to unlock all of them. However, now it was different. As an Ain Herjar, he specialized in wielding all kinds of weapons thanks to the gladiator class that Optimus had chosen. With this, William's clones were now able to enact all of his war arts using the original weapons. What did this mean? This meant that there would no longer be a time limit of one minute when the skill was used. As long as his clones were active, they would be able to use their weapon's respective war art, infinitely. After they had received their respective weapons, the thirteen clones moved a few meters away from William and Chiffon, with their weapons pointed in thirteen different directions. They were like the members of the royal guard that protected their king from any threat that would put his life at harm. William held Chiffon's hand and gave it a light squeeze before glancing at the priestess who was still holding the book in her hands. Resume the ceremony, William said. I am the one who will be marrying this girl. William expected that the priestess would not cooperate, but to his surprise, the latter only nodded her head and continued where she had left off earlier. May you always be able to talk things over, to confide in each other, to laugh with each other, to enjoy life together, and to share moments of quiet and peace, when the day is done. May you be blessed with a lifetime of happiness and a home of warmth and understanding. After saying these words, the corner of the lady's lips curled up into a smile. She had come to fulfill the promise that she had made thousands of years ago. However, she could only do so much. She hoped that the silver-haired warrior in front of her would be strong enough to protect his young bride. Because if not then the price she had to pay to enter the Tower of Babylon would all be in vain. Chapter 632, You Leave Me No Choice Belial raised his hand and the forces under his command roared in unison. Kill. Belial ordered as he flew towards William. He planned to deal with the troublemaker himself, and leave the clones to his subordinates. Seeing that the Guardian decided to face him head on, William answered the challenge. He wouldn't allow any other man to marry Chiffon. The pink-haired girl had already suffered so much in her previous and current lifetime. If he allowed the Guardian to eat her heart then he wouldn't be able to forgive himself for the rest of his life. William held the wooden staff that had accompanied him since his childhood. For others, this weapon must be the most mundane weapon in existence. However, only a few knew this weapon's true form. It was the weapon that the God of Shepherds had carried since he was born in the Temple of the Ten Thousand Gods. It was quite similar to Lily's weapon, a candy cane. If one were to only look at it at face value, it was not threatening at all. William still didn't know the true form of his wooden staff, but there was something he knew with certainty. The wooden staff in his hand was indestructible. Even if he faced off against the sharpest sword in the multiverse, his staff wouldn't be cut in two. He decided to fight against Belial since the latter wouldn't dare to harm Chiffon because he needed her heart. William also feared that the pink-haired girl would be caught in the crossfire, so he decided to battle Belial in the sky. Illuminate the world, one of William's clones shouted. Wrong Omniad. A blinding beam of light obliterated the Yerim Mawyha who's that was in front of William's clone. They all had their respective defending positions, and they would not allow anyone to come near the altar. Exterminate, another one of William's clones chanted as he pulled back the string of the bow in his hands Kersalakados. A green arrow shot forth from the bow and multiplied into the tens of thousands, hitting everything in a spray shot. The monsters that were hit by this attack shrieked in pain because the arrows shot by this bow carried a deadly poison. Strike with unparalleled precision, Gung Nir. Pierce through the void, Longinus. Go for the kill, Gabulg. Waves upon waves of monsters tried to climb up the pyramid in order to deal with William's clones. Their numbers were endless, but the clones stood their ground and attacked any monster that came within their weapons' respective range. William's clone, who was holding Arendite, held Chiffon's hand as the priestess continued the wedding in the midst of the chaotic battle. Meanwhile, above the pyramid, Belial and William clashed against each other. Their powerful collisions sent shockwaves in the air, and sounded like peals of thunder. Quick Shot War Art, First Form 
the tip of William's staff collided with Belial's sword, which the latter used to defend itself from William's frenzied attack. Railgun The Guardian was blasted away by the power of William's war art. Not only that, Belial's chest had a gaping hole in it, which had surprised not only the Guardian of the 51st floor, but the other guardians of the tower as well. It is still useless, Oagwe said. No matter how many times Belial is injured, as long as he is inside his domain, no one can kill him. Just like the small turtle said, Belial's injury regenerated at a rapid pace. You won't win. Belial sneered. Just surrender and accept your fate. You're right, I may not win, William admitted as he took a fighting stance. But, I will also not lose. As if to prove his point, William once again closed the distance and slammed his weapon full force on Belial's head. The Guardian activated the powers of the world to defend himself from William's attack. But, the barrier he had erected immediately shattered and the wooden staff smashed Belial's head like a watermelon. As soon as the attack connected, William felt that he had forgotten something. Something very important to him, but he knew that there was no other way to deal with the current situation. Memories of smiling children, the kind auntie at the orphanage who would always bake cookies for them during the weekends, and a few other memories slowly disappeared without a trace. I told you it's useless. Belial roared and materialized behind William, giving him a strong kick that sent the silver-haired warrior towards the ground. William twisted his body and a powerful gust of wind erupted under his feet, breaking his fall and allowing him to soar towards the sky and fight the guardian for another round. Belial clicked his tongue in irritation. Although he could materialize and interfere with the challengers in his floor, there were still many rules within the tower that prevented him from doing certain things. His inability to muster the full power of his divinity was one of them. Although he had broken the taboo, there were just some things that he couldn't do as long as he was in the Tower of Babylon. As long as the requirements weren't met. His hands and feet were tied and he could only fight William with his demonic legion with the current power he had in the physical body he was currently residing in. You leave me no choice. Belial roared as he flew straight towards Chiffon. Although her heart still hadn't bloomed to its fullest, the power of the divinity inside it would be enough to allow him to break the shackles that bound him to the Tower of Babylon. Although it is regrettable, he wouldn't allow anyone to get in the way of his thousand-year wait for freedom. William's clone who was holding Chiffon's hand narrowed his gaze as he aimed Arendite at the approaching guardian, who was determined to take the heart of their bride. Cut through the firmament, the clone shouted, Raise the world, Arendite. A reddish-black beam of light erupted at the tip of the demonic sword that was said to equal the power of the sword Caliban. Caliban was a sword that was said to be more powerful than the holy sword, Excalibur. For Arendite to be labeled as its equal, proved that this demonic sword, that was said to be capable of butchering dragons, was one of the strongest legendary weapons in existence. Belial gritted his teeth as he disappeared from the path of the beam of light that was meant to obliterate his body. He then reappeared in front of the clone and delivered a powerful palm strike that sent it flying. Belial didn't even bother to look at what happened to the annoying clone and hurriedly grabbed Chiffon in a princess carry. He then turned into a mist carrying the girl towards the sky. The Guardian planned to take Chiffon to the safest place in his domain, where he would ravage every part of her being. Belial even concocted a sinister plan to cast a projection into the skies of his domain, and show William how helpless he was to even attempt to prevent the Guardian from ravaging his young bride. The Guardian planned to do this out of spite, and show William that he couldn't stop the inevitable. As long as he was in his domain, the laws of the world would bend to his will. Chiffon didn't show any kind of resistance and merely stared blankly in space. However, a tear slid down at the corner of her eyes. Belial was in too much of a hurry to notice this change. All he wanted to do was to escape to a place where William couldn't reach him, and let his countless demonic legion to tear the silver-haired warrior, and his hateful clones, to shreds. Chapter 633 the heart moves where the heart wills part 1. William sped upwards with all his might in order to catch up to the fleeing guardian. Something was telling him that if he allowed Belial to leave his sights, he would never see Chiffon ever again. 
the mist that carried the pink-haired girl condensed together and Belial took on his demonic form. He was just a few hundred meters away from the anchor that bound him to the domain. As long as he would be able to pass that point, he would be able to get rid of the pursuer that was slowly closing the gap between them. As the Guardian made his final sprint, a portal appeared a few meters in front of him. Two colorful birds flew past him and glared hatefully at the person who tried to take their close friend against her will. F asterisk CKU. B1 screeched as it unleashed a barrage of magic missiles from the two lollipops it was holding in its claws. The magic missile's damage was dependent upon William's intelligence stat. Right now, the half-elf's intelligence stat was at 1322, which allowed the power of the indigo lollipop to reach a threatening level. B1 had properly aimed his attack in order to not hurt Chiffon. The magic bullets peppered Belial's body making him lose his hold on the young lady in his arms. The guardian was about to retrieve the girl, but a second wave of magic bullets once again slammed into his body without any shred of mercy. F asterisk CKU2 B2 cursed out of anger. The attack had pushed Belial away, preventing him from chasing the falling girl, and bringing her to his private domain. Unbeknownst to William, Chiffon had secretly made B1 and B2 her beast companions. The two dumb birds had been the pink-haired girl's close friends ever since William had brought her to the Thousand Beast domain. They had long wanted to appear on the Devil's Floor because they had sensed that something had happened to Chiffon. However, the laws of the world had prevented them from doing so. When William's clone, who was wielding Arendite, unleashed a powerful attack, the two birds' connection to Chiffon strengthened, allowing them to come to her rescue. Belial roared in anger as he reformed his body and regenerated his wounds. He was about to try again to reclaim the young bride, when two powerful screeches rang in his ear. Brave and gruddy bird! The two dumb birds' bodies grew until their wingspan was three meters long. B1 transformed into a red phoenix, while B2 transformed into a blue phoenix. The two phoenixes shrouded themselves in flame as they rammed Belial with their body. F asterisking cunt, how dare you hurt our chiffon. B1 cursed angrily and clawed Belial's face until its blazing claws drew blood. B2 wasn't being idle either as it used its burning wings to slap Belial's back making him cough a mouthful of green blood. B asterisk tch, this sir is going to tear you apart. Fing motherfur. B2 cursed as it clawed, pecked, and slapped Belial with its wings, causing the guardian to scream in pain. While the two ungruddy birds were going on a rampage, William caught Chiffon and headed back towards the pyramid. He knew that as long as the pink flower didn't return to where it belonged inside Chiffon's body, her safety was still an issue. William noticed that Chiffon's body felt cold to the touch. Perhaps, it was due to the humidity in the atmosphere, or perhaps Belial's coldness had rubbed off on her when he carried her towards the skies. The half-elf hugged the girl tighter. He wanted to share his warmth with her, and make sure that she didn't suffer from the cold. The clones were busy fending off the minions of the Guardians with their superior firepower. Even though they were completely outnumbered, the power of the legendary weapons was not something to sneeze at. William landed beside the altar while hugging Chiffon. He then looked at the priestess and asked for the ceremony to continue. The priestess nodded her head, but instead of continuing to read the book, she closed it and made a gesture to William. Say your vows to her, the priestess said. Since she is incapable of giving an answer, it is up to you to profess your feelings for her. William glanced at the young bride in his arms. He understood that the priestess was right, and there was no way for Chiffon to answer his vow. However, that was fine with him. In their past lifetime, it was Chiffon that chased after him. Now, it was his turn. William lowered his body and knelt in front of the pink-haired girl who had accompanied him in his journey through the Tower of Babylon. While the time that they had spent together was not that long, William knew in his heart that he wanted Chiffon to be part of his life forever. I pledge to honor you, love you, and cherish you, as my wife today and every day, William said softly amidst the great battle that was happening around them. The roars, screams, and war cries, 
weren't able to pierce the soundproofing spell that he had erected around the altar. Today I say, I do but to me that means, I will, William declared with all of his heart. I will take your hand and stand by your side in the good and the bad. I dedicate myself to your happiness, success, and smile. I will love you forever. I promise to be your guiding light in the darkness, a warming comfort in the cold, and a shoulder to lean on when life is too much to bear on your own. William took out the box that Adephagia had given him when the two of them had met. The goddess of gluttony had said that the box would open at the right time, and William believed that now was the right time. The moment the box was taken out of William's storage ring, it floated in the air and opened by itself. Inside, a golden ring with runic carvings shimmered with expectations. William took the ring out from the box and reached out to hold Chiffon's delicate left hand. I was supposed to say, give me your hand, and I will give you forever. William smiled as he slid the ring that would mark Chiffon as his wife on her ring finger. Instead. I will promise you that today I will have all the patience and passion that love demands. In the laughter and in the silence, I'll be forever by your side. I love you, Chiffon. The priestess nodded to acknowledge the vows that William had said. She didn't expect that the boy would be this fluent in proposing his love. It was quite unfortunate that his young bride wasn't able to say her own vows of love in her current state. William Von Ainsworth you have expressed your love to your beloved, and through the commitment and promises you have just made. I now pronounce you husband and wife, the priestess announced. You may now kiss the bride. William half rose as he cupped Chiffon's face. He then pressed his lips over hers and gave her a sweet and lingering kiss. A kiss that bound them together for the rest of their lives. The pink flower that floated in front of Chiffon's chest shone brightly. It was like a supernova that illuminated the crimson world that had remained unconquerable for the past thousand years. When Belial saw this light, he roared in anger and tried to use his power as a guardian to forcefully take Chiffon's heart who had reached the pinnacle of its power. Unfortunately, the pink-haired girl's two beast companions didn't allow him to do as he wished. Not in my watch, Mother Fasterisker. B1 angrily slapped Belial's face with its blazing wing and pushed the guardian a few meters away from his location. B2's body blazed in a blue radiance as it rammed Belial's body with all its might. The two dumb birds were willing to use suicidal attacks to prevent Belial from acquiring their master's heart. Belial screamed in anger and frustration as the two birds used their bodies to block him at every turn. Although B1 and B2 received severe injuries from Belial's counter-attack they didn't back away and continued their relentless attacks. They'd rather burn their lives away than allow the Guardian to even touch a strand of hair from Chiffon's head. Back at the altar, the pink flower embedded itself into Chiffon's chest then disappeared not long after. It was also at that moment when William's kiss ended. He was about to pull back, when a pair of soft and delicate hands cupped his face, stopping him from moving away. Chiffon's lifeless eyes slowly regained their vitality and stared straight into William's own green eyes with tenderness. Big brother, was everything that you said earlier true? Chiffon asked. The vows that you made, are you going to fulfill them? Yes, William replied with a smile. Are we really married? Am I truly your wife? Yes. Big brother, do you love me? I do. This time, Chiffon took the initiative and kissed William's lips. Her soft lips, pressed over his as tears slid down the side of her face. Right now, her heart was beating wildly inside her chest. She felt loved. She felt happy. She felt that her life was finally complete. Amidst the chaos on that forsaken floor. Amidst Belial's angry screams. Amidst the gazes of the other guardians in the Tower of Babylon. Two hearts that had been apart for thousands of years. Had finally become one. Chapter 634, The Heart Moves Where the Heart Wills Part 2 Within the temple of the ten thousand gods, a squeal of happiness broke the peace. The lowly goddess, Lily, touched her cheeks as she looked at the projection in front of her. She was fang earling so hard because William's vow of love, and Chiffon's assertiveness made her feel as if the one getting married was her and not Chiffon. 
the little lowly then jumped and gave the fat goddess beside her a high five. Adephagia had tears streaming down from her eyes, but that didn't stop her from celebrating with Lily. Now William finally has a lowly as his wife. Lily laughed happily. Big Brother really won the lottery this time. Of course he won the lottery. Adephagia laughed as she wiped the tears from her eyes. That bastard used all the karma in all of his past lives just to marry my daughter. HMP. If he dares bully Chiffon, I will descend to Hestia and sit on his head. Lily giggled because she knew that the goddess of gluttony was only half joking. She truly believed that if William really did treat Chiffon badly, Adephagia would stay true to her word and give William a piece of her mind. Issei and David, who were standing a few meters away from the two goddesses, exchanged a knowing look at each other. In a small hut outside the outskirts of the temple, Gavin looked at the projection in front of him with a smile on his face. He was still not fully recovered, but when he felt William use the blessing that he had given him in the past, the god of all trades woke up from his slumber and watched as William battled for his lovely young bride, who was currently showering him with kisses. That's my boy, Gavin chuckled. However, his chuckle didn't last long because of the sudden pain on his chest. Even so, he was truly happy because the boy had made him proud. He then laid back on the bed as he closed his eyes. Gavin hoped that the next time he opened his eyes, William would have reached greater heights. Also, he wished that his other disciple in Hestia would come and meet the boy. He believed that William would learn a lot from his senior brother. Why are both of my followers so shameless? Is this a trait of those who follow my path? The jack of all trades sighed before he closed his eyes to sleep. He didn't know what would happen once his two disciples met. He could only hope that his two shameless, and arrogant, disciples would not band together to destroy an empire or two. Chiffon kissed William lovingly. This was the first time that she had kissed someone, and for her, it tasted very sweet. It was sweeter than the lollipops that the half-elf had given her. Perhaps, it was due to the overflowing love that she was feeling for William, and the latter's overflowing love for her as well. The two kissed, and kissed some more. At first, the priestess was smiling, and the clones were smiling. However, the two continued to keep kissing, not caring that the world around them was starting to become malevolent. The priestess cleared her throat, and decided to put an end to the newlyweds' public display of affection. There was something more important to take care of, and the two could continue kissing after they had survived the calamity they were about to face. It is best that you save your kisses for later, the priestess said. The guardian has decided to go all out and use the full power of his domain to crush the two of you. The first to pull back was Chiffon. She stared at the priestess for a few seconds before giving William one last peck on the lips. After that, she held her cheeks in embarrassment, and averted her gaze. It was also at that moment when two figures fell from the sky and crashed at the base of the pyramid. They were none other than B1 and B2, who had been slapped by Belial from the sky using his full power. You puny mortals dare to defy this god. Belial's hateful voice descended from the sky making the entire world tremble. I will capture your souls and torture them for eternity. Suddenly, the world trembled for the second time. The eyes of the monsters around the pyramid glowed bloody red, and their bodies increased in size. The meter-tall Yerimma Yahus became two meters tall, and the towering cockatrice and basilisk stared angrily at those who had defied their master. Belial transformed into a hundred-meter-tall giant demonic creature with two pairs of bloody wings at its back. His two curved horns glowed in a crimson hue, and his eyes shone like the flames from hell. Just like the priestess said, Belial was now going all out. It seemed that he had reached the requirement to unlock his true form after William successfully married Chiffon. Chiffon, let's teach that guardian a lesson, William said as he summoned his staff. Un. Chiffon replied as she stared at the demon who tried to make her his wife. B1, B2, let's fight together. The two dumb birds forcefully propped themselves off the ground, before transforming into two beams of light. They merged together and entered Chiffon's body. 
a golden flame then started to burn on Chiffon's forehead. The power of the flame intensified and rose up in the air until it became a foot long. Two pairs of wings sprouted behind Chiffon's back. One of them was red, the other blue. Chiffon then equipped her devourer's gauntlets. She then hovered in the air to match William's height. Optimus, please. I'm counting on you, William said as he prepared himself to go all out against the guardian of the 51st floor. Understood. Leave it to me, Will. Optimus knew that William would have no choice but to use the power of his skill, Rule Breaker, in order to effectively fight against Belial. They were at a disadvantage if the Guardian were to forcefully use the power of the laws of the tower against them. Although the price was steep, it was the price that William had to pay to fight against an opponent that was equal to a demigod. William's clones also took a fighting stance. Their aim was to annihilate the countless monsters in front of them and deal with the Guardian once and for all. Charge! William ordered as he took the initiative to fly towards the towering demonic Guardian in the distance. Chiffon matched William's speed and flew alongside him. The thirteen clones also followed suit, and flanked the two lovers on both sides. Kill! Belial ordered as he unleashed a barrage of fireballs aimed in William's and Chiffon's direction. His plan, to extract the girl's heart, was already in tatters. Even if he could capture Chiffon once again, he would no longer have the chance to absorb her power and divinity. If he wanted to use the heart devil to corrupt Chiffon once again, he would have to wait a year to do so. That was time he no longer had because he decided to go all out and use the power of the divinities that he had absorbed in the past. The clone that held Solial sneered as he advanced to face the barrage of fireballs that Belial had unleashed. Absorb them all, Solial. The clone ordered. Solial answered his call and the fireballs were sucked into the spear's blade further empowering its capabilities. Bloom in the battlefield. The clone roared. Fleur du Solile. Solile was a weapon of mass destruction. William had seen its full capabilities when Lug, the god of the sun, had used it during their battle in the heavenly domain. The flaming spear had long gained sentience and trailed across the sky like a falling meteor, that would burn and destroy everything around it. The clone didn't aim Solile at Belial because he knew that it would be of no use. Belial could use the laws of the world to protect itself from most attacks, and William had to pay with his memories in order to break through them. William had already communicated with them that it would be Chiffon and him who would fight against Belial. The clones, on the other hand, would ensure that none of the Guardian's minions would get in the way of their battle. A world-shaking explosion took place as Solile descended on the horde of monsters. It instantly annihilated everything that was several hundred meters away from its landing site, and raised the surroundings in a hellish flames. Fools, you forget that I am the god of this world. Belial raised his hand and the flames that were spreading like wildfire rose into the sky and transformed into flaming wyverns that flew towards William's group. William's clone sneered as he summoned Solile back to his hands. Fool, no matter what form it takes, flames will always be flames. The clone raised Solile once again and all the fire wyverns were sucked into it like moths to a flame. Although Belial held the divinity of flames, Solile was a weapon of the god of the Sunday. Clearly, between his feeble flames and the might of the sun, Belial's divinity fell far too short. The thousands of basilisk that had grown up to twenty meters long, raised their hands and unleashed a poison spray that was strong enough to kill a centennial beast in minutes. William was about to use a spell to deflect their attacks, but he stopped after Chiffon took the initiative to fly ahead of their formation. The pink-haired girl then opened her mouth and a black rotating sphere appeared in front of it. Just like a small black hole, the poison was devoured until nothing was left. As if waiting for that cue, William's clones spread out, and descended to the ground. Each of them unleashed the power of their legendary weapons causing massive destruction in their respective positions. William and Chiffon zigzagged in the air as they dodged the red vines that Belial had summoned to capture them. They were the same vines that had wrapped around William's body when he was still inside the dream world that was made by his heart devil. Belial's frenzied attacks didn't phase the two lovers as they gathered the powers in their hands. 
The two worked together to deflect the Guardian's attacks that they couldn't dodge, as they closed the distance. When they were only a hundred meters away from the towering behemoth in front of them, the two glanced at each other and nodded their heads in unison. The four elements, as well as the power of lightning merged together in William's hand creating a crackling rainbow sphere of elemental energy. Eradicate, William roared. World End Countless red butterflies materialized around Chiffon as she, too, prepared her strongest attack. Shatter the void. Chiffon shouted. Bloodwing. Tempest. The two delivered their combined attacks at Belial's chest. However, just like William expected a powerful barrier was erected in place. William gritted his teeth as countless images from his past life disappeared from his memories. A beautiful lady with long black hair, holding a bow in her hand stood elegantly in the distance. Her pose was the image of perfection as she released the arrow from her hand. A soft sob escaped William's lips as the fleeting image escaped his memories. That was the first time she saw Belle in the academy, and he had fallen in love with her at first sight. William roared as his memories burned away. The barrier in front of him shattered in his attack, and Chiffon's, slammed full force at the Guardian's chest, destroying it completely. The Guardians who were watching the battle couldn't believe what they saw. They had long tossed away the idea of William being able to beat Belial successfully. But, the scene in front of them made them realize that they were completely wrong. Belial's pain scream resounded throughout the Devil's Floor, and along with it, William's first encounter with Belle was wiped away from his memory. Chapter 635 I'm still hungry. I have room for desserts. A powerful explosion shook the 51st floor when its guardian was blasted away by William's and Chiffon's combined attack. I am possible. Belial gazed at his chest, where several cracks were spreading at a fast rate. He had utilized the laws of the Devil's Floor to make himself practically untouchable, and invincible. However, for some reason, William had been constantly breaking the rules that he had set to prevent anyone from clearing the 51st floor. All the guardians that saw this scene had a look of disbelief in their faces. They were not aware of the price that William had to pay, each time he broke the rules of the Tower of Babylon. Belial slowly rose from the ground as the cracks continued to spread across his body. William's clones were decimating everything that surrounded them, so no monsters were able to come near their master who was on the verge of a complete breakdown. Who are you? Belial roared in anger. Just who are you? William sneered at the guardian who dared to touch one of the most important people in his life. Just a shepherd, William replied. And the lover of the girl you tried to marry against her will. Belial laughed. But, he didn't laugh out of happiness. He laughed out of anger and frustration at his current circumstances. The guardian who ruled a floor of the Tower of Babylon was reduced to a sorry state, after eating the hearts of those who challenged his floor for the past thousand years. In truth, Belial had long lost the protection of the Tower of Babylon. If he were to return to his home world, or try to leave the Tower, he would immediately disintegrate into nothingness. This was why he had resolved himself to devour as many hearts as he could, until he was able to break free from his self-imposed prison which was the 51st floor. This is not over. Belial stated as his body crumbled little by little. This is my domain. As long as this domain stands, I am immortal. I will return, and once I do, I will torture you and that little b asterisk tch for eternity. Sorry, but there won't be a next time, William replied as he looked at the pink-haired girl floating beside him. Chiffon, let's fight together. William said softly. Chiffon nodded and moved towards William. She then cupped William's face and stared straight at his eyes. I love you, big brother, Chiffon said affectionately. Let's end this, and return together. William wrapped his arms around her and stared back at her eyes filled with fondness. I love you, too. After this, let's get back together. A sweet, and beautiful smile bloomed on Chiffon's face. This was the first time that William had seen Chiffon smile like this, and it made his heart skip a beat. 
The pink-haired girl then kissed William's lips as the latter held her tight. A moment later, Chiffon turned into pink particles of light and flew towards the gem embedded in William's chest. Familia Oversoul William closed his eyes as Chiffon's power and divinity merged with his own. A golden flame appeared on William's forehead, just like it had with Chiffon earlier. The flame burned brightly, just like his young bride's love for him. Two pairs of blazing wings sprouted behind his back. The Devourer's gauntlets also equipped themselves on William's hand and a powerful aura erupted around him. William's clones turned into colorful beams of light and merged with his body. The legendary weapons floated around William's body as they gathered their powers to completely obliterate the guardian that was barely hanging on to dear life. William gathered the elemental powers in his hand and synchronized with the legendary weapons around him. World and Tempest William unleashed the strongest attack of his Ain Herjar job class. It was an ability that was created when the world was about to end. It was an attack that William had used when he faced the God of Destruction, who had raised the Nine Realms to the ground. Answering to his call, Rong Ominiad, Gabulk, Longinus, Chris Alakatos, Gungnir, Caliban, Grail Sword, Galatine, Arendite, and Kurekhaus unleashed their strongest attacks. Their combined attacks disintegrated Belial's giant body, creating a world-shattering explosion. Belial's hateful scream spread across the Devil's floor, but William knew that this was not enough to finish the Guardian. What he did was to simply prevent his opponent from taking material form. Just as he expected, the crimson clouds in the sky swirled and took on the face of the guardian that he had destroyed. Just you wait. Belial's hate-filled words made the entire domain tremble. I will be back. This is not over. William raised his head to look up at the sky. No. This is over. When he had married Chiffon, the pink-haired girl was registered as one of his familia members. What did this mean? This meant that William was able to use Chiffon's power and divinity. Familia Fourth Familia Member Chiffon Hal Ainsworth Host is able to use Devour X, Divine. Host has acquired Familia over Soul Skill. Increase plus 30 Enhancement Bonus to all stats. Synchronization Rate, 35%. Belial was impossible to defeat completely as long as he was the administrator of the 51st floor. As long as the Devil's floor existed, Belial would be reborn again and again. This was the sole privilege that remained to him after breaking the taboo of the tower. That same privilege was responsible for making the 51st floor unconquerable. Since that was the case, there was only one thing that William could do to ensure that the Guardian would cease to exist and that was to devour the Devil's Floor in its entirety. Devour X The silver-haired half-elf opened his mouth and a rotating black sphere appeared in front of it. At first, this sphere was only the size of a golf ball, but it didn't take long before it grew bigger, until it became as big as a basketball. Belial sneered at William. He didn't know what the boy was planning, but he was sure that no matter what his adversary did, it would still be useless against him. It was at that moment when the air around William quivered. A few seconds later, one of the Yerim Mawaiche who's on the ground shrieked as it was pulled into the air by an invisible sucking force. Soon, more monsters rose in the air, shrieking in panic and fear as a powerful force forced them off the ground. It didn't take long before Belial felt that something was terribly wrong. He felt that his connection with his minions were lost the moment they were swallowed by the black rotating sphere that hovered a few inches from William's mouth. Soon, the crimson clouds where he had taken form was also being pulled by the sphere that seemed to devour everything in existence. Not good. Belial finally felt that his very existence was in mortal peril. He decisively used all the power he could muster to escape towards the private domain that he had planned to take Chiffon earlier. However, just as he was about to break free from the powerful suction that came from the black rotating sphere, two words reached his ears that made his blood turn cold. Dual X Belial was alarmed when he realized that his current form was not responding to his orders, and thoughts. No. Belial fired a barrage of spells at William in desperation, to prevent the silver-haired half-elf from devouring him. 
All of the Guardian's attacks were sucked up by the rotating black sphere, causing no damage whatsoever. You won. Belial shouted. I recognize you as the new owner of the 51st floor. You have cleared this floor. The power of the suction force grew stronger, devouring countless monsters from the ground. If Jekyll was around, he would definitely be surprised because William's devouring power far exceeded his own. I don't need your recognition, William answered via telepathy. I want your life. Belial struggled with every fiber of his being. He knew that the moment he was sucked by the rotating black sphere, he would cease to exist. Desperate for William's mercy and forgiveness, the guardian of the 51st floor promised him many things. Promises of great rewards that were only exclusive from the Tower of Babylon, but William wasn't interested in such things. Curse you! Belial roared hatefully. The other guardians will avenge me. They will avenge me. You will pay for your insolence. They will rip your body apart and torture your soul for eternity. William answered Belial's threat with a chuckle. I'd like to see them try, William answered. I'm still hungry. I have room for a multitude of desserts. It was not only the guardians of the first fifty floors that were paying attention to the battle. Even the guardians from the fifty-second floor up to the one hundredth floor were there to witness everything that had happened from the start. All of them had been bored out of their minds since no one was able to clear the fifty-first floor. This was why William's appearance made them very happy. However, when they heard Belial's words, all of them immediately panicked and gave Belial the middle finger. F asterisk king bastard. If you're going to die, just die. Don't involve others to your doom. Their bodies unconsciously shuddered as they cursed Belial for involving them in his problem. If possible, the guardians of the Tower of Babylon wanted to drown Belial in spit because his words might have made William think that they would make things difficult for him as he continued his conquest in the Tower of Babylon. They were very afraid that the boy would also devour their entire floors, and end their existences in the most horrifying way possible. Chapter 636, The Final Match of the Tournament of Champions Part 1 Today, the number of people in the Grand Arena had far exceeded the number of the previous matches. It was quite understandable because this was the final match of the Tournament of Champions. Today, the greatest prodigy of the young generation would be crowned. A day before the match started, all the seats in the Grand Arena had all been sold out. Business-minded individuals had used this opportunity to auction their tickets, so that they could profit from the grand event. The rulers had already taken their seats and were looking forward to the outcome of the match. This was the last match of the tournament, so they wanted to see it until the end. Empress Androsta had a confident smile on her face. For her, this match held no suspense. She had complete faith in her daughter. Even though her daughter had mentioned in passing that Kenneth might be one of the deadly sins, the Amazon Empress wasn't too bothered. No matter what it took, the Amazons must show everyone their domineering side. They were a race that recognized the strong. For them, strength was everything. Almost all races had to admit that the elves were among the superior races in the world of Hestia. However, the Amazons didn't think that way. For them, they were the superior race. Why? Because they would only allow strong men to become their partners, and give birth to their children. For the Amazons, the genes of an individual was of the utmost priority. The stronger that person was, the more attractive he was to the Amazonian race. This was also the reason why they joined this tournament. They were looking for potential seeds that they could invite back to their empire and let them sire the new generation of Amazons that would make their empire reach its peak of power. Kenneth was one of the seeds that Empress Androsta had her eyes on. However, since her daughter had mentioned that Kenneth was one of the deadly sins, he must definitely be a girl. However, right now, no matter what artifact she used to check Kenneth's gender, the result was always male. Of course, Empress Androsta had been present during Kenneth's last match when his hair grew extraordinarily long. With the elf's delicate-looking face, and his long hair, everyone would think of him as a girl. Empress Androsta was not an exception. 
Regardless, the fact still remained was that Kenneth was a boy right now. Unless he was using a special artifact that changed his gender, the Amazon Empress would still take him with him back to the Amazon Empire, by force if she had to. Emperor Leonidas stood at the podium as he addressed the audience who was looking forward to the final battle between Kenneth and Lilith. As the host of the tournament, the Creator Emperor handled everything flawlessly. He didn't scrimp on the budget of the event and ensured that everything would run smoothly. As he looked at the last two finalists who were waiting to climb up the arena, he felt a sense of regret that his grandson, Prince Jason, had been eliminated in his previous battle. If he had won, he would have represented the Creator Empire in this battle for supremacy. Today is the final day of the tournament. Emperor Leonidas' charismatic voice spread across the arena. Only one name will rise to claim the title of the strongest champion of the young generation. I know that all of you are already tired of waiting, so let the final match commence. Emperor Leonidas declared. A thunderous applause answered his declaration. The emperor returned to his seat and the referee of the final match made a gesture for both combatants to step on the arena. Lilith walked with confidence, while Kenneth walked in silence. Their presence was different, and the people were leaning towards Lilith more because of her beauty, and confident appearance. Some of the ladies cheered for Kenneth. They always liked the underdogs, and Kenneth was a delicate-looking teenager that made the girls giggle in their seats. After the two came face to face in the arena, Lilith smirked as she placed one of her hands on her waist. Tell me, are you really one of us? Lilith asked. I've always thought that I only had sisters. I'm going to be perfectly honest, you're too girly to be my type. But, some of my friends might take a liking to you. Do you want to visit our empire? I promise that you will be treated as a VIP by the Amazonian race. Kenneth didn't answer and simply unsheathed his short sword from its scabbard. He was still feeling sleepy, so he had no strength or time to have a conversation with the talkative Amazon princess. Seeing that she was being ignored completely, Lilith clicked her tongue. Fine. I'll just drag you to our empire whether you like it or not, Lilith declared. Although you're not really my type, my friends will definitely love to have your genes. I guess your children will be decent warriors once they grow up. Kenneth remained silent and simply waited for the battle to start. He intended to end the battle as fast as he could because he was not in peak condition. The referee didn't want to delay the match either, so he raised his hand and declared the start of the battle. Final match start. Lilith's expression became serious as he summoned her war axe. This was the same weapon that he had used during her battle with Prince Jason, but she never had gotten the chance to use it. Right now, the Amazon princess wielded the weapon with both hands. She was certain that Kenneth was one of the deadly sins, which meant that she couldn't take him lightly. Kenneth, on the other hand, pointed his sword in Lilith's direction and chanted. Spirits of time, veil us from the gaze of the Creator, Kenneth said and his silver-gray hair grew until it touched the ground. Time stop. Lilith was about to charge at Kenneth, but before she was even able to execute her plan, the elf had already frozen her in time. The Amazon warrior was in the act of running with her war axe raised high. However, she stayed in that position like a statue, unable to even blink her eyes. Kenneth walked towards his opponent in a steady pace in order to not break the time spell that he had cast. A gust of wind blew inside the arena, making his long silver-gray hair flutter. Although his gender was still in question, everyone would agree that the delicate-looking elf in his current appearance would easily pass as a beautiful young lady. Within the safety of the Creator Empire VIP room, Princess Sidney watched with bated breath, as the person she hated the most, thrust his blade on the Amazon's princess chest. Clearly, Kenneth wanted to end the match as soon as possible. He didn't care for fame and honor. All he cared about was freeing William from the grasp of the lusty princess, whom he believed had used underhanded tricks in order to force his ex-roommate, and the son of his master, to become her fiancé. Chapter 637 the final match of the Tournament of Champions Part 2. The moment Kenneth's blade pierced Lilith's chest, a loud cracking sound was heard. 
The body of the Amazon princess shattered like a vase, and the war axe that she was holding in her hands fell on the ground, embedding itself on the arena. Kenneth immediately took a few steps back and scanned his surroundings. His long hair spread out like living snakes, and took a defensive stance around him. Now, I know what sin you bear. A teasing voice whispered in Kenneth's ears, and the latter immediately tried to find where the sound of the voice was coming from. I don't know if you are a sister, or a brother, but it doesn't matter. I will find out soon enough. The only one that could hear the voice was Kenneth, and he was finding it hard to pinpoint the location of the voice because Lilith was using telepathy to talk to him. Now that I know your sin, I now know how to beat you. Lilith chuckled. Kenneth narrowed his eyes as he extended his senses to encompass his surroundings. Right now, he was tapping on the power of his divinity. He couldn't keep this state for a long time, so he needed to finish Lilith as soon as possible. You know, I can just wait for the power of your divinity to disappear before I attack you, Lilith commented. However, that will leave a bad aftertaste. I came here to fight, not to hide. Then fight. Kenneth interjected and shouted in his mind. Show me what the proud Amazon princess can do. Very well, but let's agree on a condition first. A condition? Yes, Lilith's playful voice answered. You are not allowed to stop my time. If you break this condition, I promise you that you will regret it. Kenneth readily agreed to this condition. The more time that passed, the more difficult it is for him to retain his current level of power. He was already starting to feel drowsy, and he knew that it was only a matter of time before he reached his limit. I agree to your condition. Good. Now, let's have a good battle. As soon as Lilith said those lines, a blue crystal shard, the size of an electric pole jutted out of the ground, aiming at Kenneth's head. The elf pushed himself backwards using his long silver hair, and successfully dodged Lilith's surprise attack. Suddenly, the arena trembled and more crystal shards jutted out of the ground. These crystals encompassed the entire arena and surrounded Kenneth from all sides. Are you ready for this? A blue crystal that took the form of Lilith appeared in front of Kenneth and winked at him. Crystal Nova. The crystals detonated themselves, sending sharp shrapnels in every direction. Kenneth didn't move from where he stood, but his hair increased its volume and wrapped Kenneth like a yarn ball. The crystal shards bounced off at the giant ball of hair, as if they were hitting reinforced steel. These shattered crystals turned into glittering crystal dusts that fell on the ground, coating it with a bluish tint. Now I know your sin as well, Kenneth said after unwrapping himself from his protective stance. Your greed. Yes, but you don't know me well enough. Lilith giggled. You should be feeling pain, right about now. As soon as Lilith finished saying her words, Kenneth felt a burning sensation in his entire body. He hurriedly tore off the sleeve of his robe, and saw that his skin was starting to turn blue. Upon closer inspection, he noticed that the blue color was actually the crystal dust that Lily had manipulated to penetrate his skin's pores. From there, the Amazon warrior activated her powers and attacked Kenneth in a place that he least expected. The blue skin was now tainted with red blood as the crystal dusts bore deep inside his body. Don't worry, I'm not planning to kill you, Lilith said with a charming smile. My sisters will love to have a pretty boy as their plaything. Also, you are one of my kind. They will definitely take that into consideration when they squeeze you dry. As red blood dyed Kenneth's clothes, the elf remained calm and activated the power of his divinity. He gazed at the teasing smile on Lilith's place before using one of his trump cards. Rewind time. The image of a clock appeared above Kenneth's head and its hands were moving counterclockwise. The battle that Kenneth had just fought against Lilith was now a few minutes in the future. Because Kenneth couldn't use his divinity for long, he had created a checkpoint in time, right after Lilith's body shattered into pieces so he could glimpse into the future and know what his opponent was planning to do. This took a heavy toll on his body, but this was the only way he could think of to beat one of the deadly sins, whose abilities were unknown to him. A blue crystal shard, 
the size of an electric pole jutted out of the ground, aiming at Kenneth's head. Just as he did earlier, the elf pushed himself backwards using his long silver hair, and successfully dodged Lilith's surprise attack. The arena trembled and more crystal shards jutted out of the ground. These crystals encompassed the entire arena and surrounded Kenneth from all sides. Are you ready for this? A blue crystal that took the form of Lilith appeared in front of Kenneth and winked at him. Kenneth once again activated his divinity as he held the short sword in his hand. He was now feeling incredibly drowsy, so he needed to make the most of what little time he had left. Stretch the moment, Kenneth said softly. Immediately, the world around him became as slow as half a snail's pace. If one weren't paying attention, they might think that the time inside the entire arena had stopped completely. That was only half correct. What Kenneth did was to slow down the time of the entire arena, including his own time. The only thing that was working faster than normal was his brain, and he used it to calculate the moves that he needed to do in order to defeat Lilith. After calculating the exact amount of divinity that he needed to use to beat the Amazon princess, Kenneth once again activated another of his trump card. Time Leap The elf took a step forward, while the world around him was moving at a very slow pace. He didn't attack the crystal Lilith, but instead, ran towards the war axe that was embedded in the ground. Time Leap has a certain restriction. When he uses this ability, only Kenneth's body was allowed to pass through time and space. This meant that he had to leave everything behind, including his clothes. Fortunately, the long that fluttered behind him, wrapped itself around his body, creating a lightweight armor that was as hard as steel. The elf then channeled his physical strength to his right foot and kicked the handle of the war axe with all of its might. The war axe flew in the air, and soon, it transformed into the Amazon princess who was in shock because she didn't know what had happened. Accelerate. With a burst of speed, Kenneth jumped to the air and delivered a roundhouse kick, hitting Lilith squarely in the chest. The force of the blow was strong enough to send Lilith flying towards the edge of the arena. A mouthful of blood sprayed in the air as the Amazon princess received another devastating blow from her opponent. Why is he so fast? Lilith thought as she tried to use all of her strength to resist Kenneth's follow-up attack. Isn't he supposed to be slow? What's happening here? The Amazon princess knew that it didn't matter whether she succeeded in defending against Kenneth's attack or not. She would still be pushed outside of the arena regardless of what she did. The only choice she had was whether she would be able to prevent any further injuries on her body, or suffer a lethal blow that might endanger her life. Gritting her teeth, Lilith chose to block Kenneth's attack no matter what. Even if she lost this battle, she would still drag the boy back to their empire in order to exact her vengeance. Kenneth had arrived in front of Lilith and was about to deliver the coup de grace when, suddenly, his stance faltered in the air. The two crashed on the ground, with Lilith almost falling off the arena. Fortunately, she transformed her hands and feet into crystals, and dug them deep to gain a foothold. Although she looked like a monkey holding at the edge of the arena for dear life, she managed to prevent herself from falling off completely. The Amazon princess crawled back at the safety of the arena and glanced at her opponent who was currently laying on the ground. His long hair was a mess, but its volume was enough to cover his body. Lilith carefully approached Kenneth and poked him with her foot. Seeing that the elf wasn't reacting to anything, the Amazon gathered up her courage and moved closer. As the Amazon eyed her opponent, she heard a snore, which made her realize that her opponent had actually fallen asleep in the middle of their battle. Lilith didn't know whether she should laugh or cry at Kenneth's current circumstance. Oh well, a win is still a win, Lilith mused as he looked down on the sleeping elf beside her feet. No hard feelings. Lilith kicked Kenneth off the battle platform and the latter offered no form of resistance. She then raised her head in an arrogant manner as she raised her voice to declare her victory. Just as planned, Lilith declared. Everything I did was just an act. Mother Empress, how were my acting skills? Lilith waved her hand and called out to Empress Andraste whose posture almost collapsed because of her daughter's shameless behavior. 
Empress Andraste opened her fan and waved it a little to keep the heat out of her face as her lips twitched, due to her daughter's shameless boasting. Silly girl, you just made us look bad, Empress Andraste thought. She really wanted to pinch her daughter's waist for doing something unbecoming of an Amazon warrior. Ashes and Princess Sidonie's bodies stiffened because Lilith somehow reminded them of their shameless lover, whom they had lost contact with these past few days. Lilith glanced at Emperor Leonidas who was seated on the highest seat of honor. Before she came to the Creator Empire, she had mulled over the wish that she wanted to be granted. Now that she had won, she felt like it was perfectly fine for her to claim her just rewards. Emperor Leonidas, can I state my wish now? Lilith asked in a respectful manner. Although she could be arrogant at times, she still had been taught the royal etiquette of the royal bloodline of the Amazon race. The emperor of the Creator Empire nodded his head, and made a gesture for Lilith to say her wish. Lilith smiled and was about to say what she wanted the most when the resounding tolling of a bell reverberated in the air. Right after that, a dignified voice filled with authority and divinity spread across the entire world of Hestia. Let it be known to one and all that the 51st floor of the Tower of Babylon has been conquered. I repeat, let it be known to one and all that the 51st floor of the Tower of Babylon has been conquered. Emperor Leonidas, Empress Andraste and the other sovereigns of the major powers in the world of Hestia immediately rose to their feet. They couldn't believe what they heard. Someone had been able to conquer the Devil's Floor that had been deemed unconquerable, not only by the people of the world of Hestia, but the very guardians that resided within the tower itself. The dignified voice from the heavens didn't know, nor cared, about the thoughts of the mortals that lived in the world of Hestia. Its only role was to deliver the message it had been assigned to give, and it had done this ever since the Tower of Babylon had appeared in the central continent. Let it be known to one and all that the one who conquered the 51st floor of the Tower of Babylon is none other than William von Ainsworth. Chapter 638, His Legend is About to Begin Part 1 Let it be known to one and all that the one who conquered the 51st floor of the Tower of Babylon is none other than William von Ainsworth Ash and Princess Sidney's eyes widened in shock as they glanced at each other. Both of them hadn't heard from William for the past few days and they were very worried about him and Chiffon's current circumstances. They didn't expect that this was how they would know his current situation, and they were caught completely unprepared by the incredible news. Gilbert, the headmaster of the Silverwind Academy, and the one that gave William all the information he knew about the Tower of Babylon, almost choked on his saliva when he heard the worldwide announcement. It had only been a short time since William had left the Academy, and Gilbert was sure that the half-elf would give up before he could even reach the 51st floor. He didn't expect that the boy, who had caused trouble in his Academy, would really be able to clear the floor that no one had cleared for the past thousand years. That brat really did it. Gilbert pressed his hands over his chest. He actually did it. Emperor Leonidas and the rest of the rulers exchanged glances because this was something totally unexpected. With this development, the era of climbing the Tower of Babylon would once again commence, and the empires would immediately start to send their elite subordinates to fight for riches for their respective empires. Lilith, who had won the tournament, had been completely forgotten. She had been basking in the limelight, but after the announcement, her earlier fame felt like a big joke. William had completely stolen the spotlight, and it made Empress Andraste feel sorry for her daughter. However, the Amazon princess wasn't feeling depressed or affronted. Instead, her eyes lit up because an idea came to her mind. She had long wanted the half-elf who was the son of the saintess of the world tree, Lady Arwen, and dungeon conqueror, Maxwell. A devilish smile appeared on her face, which was similar to James when he was about to scam people. Zagarl, the demon general, had a frown on his face when he heard the announcement. As a demon, there was one surname that they hated the most and it was none other than the surname Ainsworth. For them, if Maxwell hadn't interfered with their invasion of the Silver Moon continent, they would have already enslaved the elves. Such a hateful family, Zagarl clenched his fist in anger. I better nip him in the bud before he can awaken his full potential. 
while Lilith, Zagarl, and the sovereigns of the various factions in the continent were making plans in their heads, they once again heard the familiar tolling of a bell. Not long afterwards, the Divine Voice spoke once again and announced a world-shaking declaration. If earlier, the first announcement surprised them, the next one alarmed them. Let it be known to one and all that the ruling family of the 49th floor, the Moro family, is now stripped off their rights as the ruling family of the 49th floor, and hereby exiled from the Tower of Babylon. I repeat, let it be known to one and all that the ruling family of the 49th floor, the Moro family, is now stripped off their rights as the ruling family of the 49th floor, and hereby exiled from the Tower of Babylon. As the mandate of the Tower of Babylon, I hereby announce the name of the new owner of the 49th floor. The new ruler of the 49th floor is none other than William von Ainsworth. I repeat. As the mandate of the Tower of Babylon, I hereby announce the name of the new owner of the 49th floor. The new ruler of the 49th floor is none other than William von Ainsworth. A grin appeared on Emperor Leonidas' face after hearing the announcement. To be perfectly honest, the moment that William conquered the 51st floor, the Emperor had finally made up his mind to write a decree that would officially recognize William as his granddaughter's fiancé. He also planned to hold a grand wedding as soon as possible to prevent other forces from nabbing the red-headed teenager, and make him the groom of their own princesses. The other sovereigns also had the same line of thought. If they could bring William under their wing then they would be able to have a share of the pie that the half-elf had nabbed for himself. What they didn't know was that it was only the beginning of a series of announcements that would make everyone in the world of Hestia know William's name. In the town of Lunt, James was roaring with laughter as he held his granddaughter, Eve, in his hands. He then decided to start calling his friends by using the communication crystals, so that he could boast about his grandson's achievements. He passed Eve to her mother, Anna, and took out the communication crystals in his storage ring. James called Lawrence and his plan was to make his old friend feel sorry for his daughter's and granddaughter's arrogant behavior. Since this was a worldwide announcement, everyone in the world of Hestia heard it. The Griffith family, who had antagonized William in the past, would definitely not feel good about the half-elf's amazing accomplishments. Ha ha ha. Lawrence, my good friend, how are you? James greeted with a big smile on his face. Lawrence snorted at James' smug expression and knew the reason why the old bastard called him. He had already expected the old coot to settle old grievances and chose this opportunity to rub salt on their faces. However, before Lawrence could even nag James for being petty, another announcement spread across the heavens. Let it be known to one and all that the ruling family of the 45th floor, the Vakazar family, is now stripped off their rights as the ruling family of the 45th floor and hereby exiled from the Tower of Babylon. I repeat, let it be known to one and all that the ruling family of the 45th floor, the Vakazar family, is now stripped off their rights as the ruling family of the 45th floor, and hereby exiled from the Tower of Babylon. As the mandate of the Tower of Babylon, I hereby announce the name of the new owner of the 45th floor. The new ruler of the 45th floor is none other than William von Ainsworth. James who had been roaring with laughter earlier choked on his own saliva and coughed out loud. After regaining his composure, James looked at his old friend Lawrence with a smirk. Sorry, old friend, James said. I will talk to you later. I still have important matters to attend to. Wait, you old bastard. We still have something to talk. James cut off the connection and didn't even bother to listen to what Lawrence was about to say. For him, there was something more important that he had to do, and he had to do it now. Ezio, come, James ordered. A black mist appeared out of nowhere and materialized in front of James. Ezio, bowed his head in greeting and waited for James's orders. Prepare to travel. We are going to the central continent, James ordered. It's time to help my grandson secure the riches that he has acquired. I don't want any annoying flies to try and get their filthy hands on the resources that belong to our family. Understood, my liege, Ezio bowed and disappeared. It had been a while since he last saw William. However, 
Ezio was amazed because his disciples' ability to stir up trouble had reached new heights after he went to the central continent. Deep inside, Ezio was really curious about how his shameless disciple managed to accomplish such an unbelievable task. Demonic Continent Speak of the devil, an old hag with a wrinkled face and a crooked nose said with amusement. You just mentioned that your disciple's name is William, right? Is that the same William that the messenger of the Tower of Babylon is announcing right now? Celine, who was kneeling on the ground to pay respects to her master, had a dumbfounded expression on her face when she heard the consecutive announcements. It wasn't that long ago that she had parted with William, and Celeste, in the central continent before looking for her master in the demonic continent. To think that on the same day she found her master, her disciples' accomplishments would be broadcasted worldwide. The old hag chuckled as she approached her disciple who had a complicated expression on her face. It seems that your first man is very capable, the old hag teased. In truth, I was about to look for him and test whether he is worthy of you. I guess, I don't need to go through all that trouble now. Master, there must have been some kind of mistake, Celine answered. The old hag chuckled for the second time as she patted Celine's soft, and silky hair. Silly girl, how could there be a mistake? The old hag commented. This is a divine message that is passed whenever someone clears a floor in the tower. I have heard it several times in my lifetime, so I can guarantee its credibility. However, what I didn't expect was that your chosen man was capable to this degree. Not only did he conquer the 51st floor, he even managed to dethrone the ruling families of the 49th and 45th floors. Truly unbelievable. The old hag was about to say more when she heard another tolling of a bell. Both she, and Celine glanced at each other in surprise, and this time, both the masters, and disciples' mouth opened wide in shock as the divine voice once again made an announcement. Silver Moon Continent Let it be known to one and all that the ruling family of the 41st floor, the Amaral family, is now stripped off their rights as the ruling family of the 41st floor and hereby exiled from the Tower of Babylon. As the mandate of the Tower of Babylon, I hereby announce the name of the new owner of the 41st floor. The new ruler of the 41st floor is none other than William von Ainsworth. I repeat. Arwen and Skyla stood side by side as they looked up at the heavens. Both of them were in the sanctuary of the World Tree when they heard the announcements about William's achievements. At first, Arwen couldn't believe what she was hearing but after a few minutes, her mood returned to normal. She then walked towards the world tree and pressed her forehead against its trunk. That's our boy, Arwen said softly. That's our little Will. The tree trunk shimmered for a brief moment as if agreeing to Arwen's words. William's mother who hadn't seen her son for years wept silently. She had long wanted to hold her son in her embrace, and wanted to shield him from all kinds of harm. However, this was not possible at this moment in time. Skyla had already told her repeatedly that her son would almost always be in the forefront of trouble, wherever he goes. It was as if he was born with the troublemaking genes that would attract all the troubles in the world to stand in his way. This is your fault, Arwen lightly tapped the trunk of the world tree. He inherited all your bad habits. The trunk glowed in protest to Arwen's claims. Skyla watched as the Saintess and the World Tree bickered at each other using their own language. In the end, she left the two and flew towards the sky. The White Crane was trying hard to fight the temptation of visiting William in the Central Continent. Skyla wanted to see just what kind of ruckus the half-elf had made this time around. The series of announcements didn't stop, and kept on coming. With each new announcement, those who heard it became baffled until their bafflement turned into numbness. The announcements were quite ridiculous, and if not for the power of divinity contained within the voice, they would think that someone was merely pranking them. The 49th floor. The 45th floor. The 41st floor. The 37th floor. The 23rd floor. The 16th floor. And finally, the second floor, which belonged to the Agnes family fell in William's hands. 
These were the floors within He Tower of Babylon that had promoted human trafficking and enslavement. After dealing with the 51st floor, William descended to the lower floors and blackmailed the guardians into tearing up the contracts that the ruling families had signed with them. For the guardians that had seen how he devoured Belial, and the entirety of the 51st floor, the choice was an easy one to make. Instead of becoming William's enemies, they decided to cooperate and broke ties with the families that had conquered their respective floors. Not only did they break the contracts, they even exiled the said families, forbidding them to set foot in the tower again. Only after finishing this endeavor did William return to the 51st floor. He still had things that he had to settle on the devil's floor, and he was almost like a spent candle after merging with Chiffon, and using the power of her divinity. The half-elf was completely oblivious that the things he did in the tower had already been announced to every corner of the world of Hestia. This information was like a tidal wave that forced everyone to stop whatever they were doing. After a thousand years of waiting, William finally paved the way for the new generation to once again challenge the Tower of Babylon, and climb to new heights that no one had reached before. Chapter 639, His Legend is About to Begin Part 2 Armstrong Duchy Wendy, E.S.T., and Isaac were currently having an afternoon tea at the balcony of the Armstrong residence when William's exploits in the Tower of Babylon rang far and wide. William's two lovers glanced at each other in disbelief. They never expected that they would hear news of their beloved half-elf in this manner, and both of them were surprised and confused about what was happening. It was at this moment, when Wendy's grandfather, Jevon Sy Armstrong, her father, Joaquin, and twin brother, Spencer, arrived at the balcony. After hearing the news, Jevon and Joaquin immediately went to look for Wendy. Spencer noticed them and decided to accompany his father and grandfather in looking for his sister, and see the reaction on her face after hearing the unbelievable news that they had just received. Wendy, E.S.T., and Isaac were about to rise from their seats to pay their respect to the former Duke of the Armstrong Duchy, when Jevon made a gesture for them to remain seated. Right now, he was not in the mood for any formalities. At ease. We are all family here, there's no need to show excessive etiquette, Jevon said with a big grin on his face. The doting grandfather looked at her granddaughter and sighed internally. Originally, he was against Wendy's and William's relationship because he never got along well with James. But, since his son, Joaquin, had said that her granddaughter was really in love with William, and the half-elf also loved Wendy, the former duke reluctantly gave the two teenagers his blessing. That grandson of James is really lucky to be able to marry my granddaughter, Jevon thought. Joaquin had ordered the maids to bring additional snacks, in order to accommodate all of them. When everyone was finally seated, Jevon finally spoke his reason for finding Wendy. Wendy, I'm sure that you heard the divine announcement a moment ago, but do you really understand what your lover has accomplished? Jevon asked. Wendy shook her head, no. Grandfather, can you please tell me more about the Tower of Babylon? Jevon nodded his head. The southern continent was quite a distance away from the central continent, so it is very normal for the younger generation to not know anything about the Tower of Babylon. EST was also very curious about what her lover had accomplished in the central continent. She waited with bated breath for Jevon to tell them the significance of William's accomplishments. Thousands of years ago, when the races had finally drawn the boundaries of the world, an announcement, similar to what you heard a while ago was heard by everyone, Jevon narrated. It said that riches, fame, honor, and glory await those who would be able to conquer the floors of the tower and reach its peak. Many years have passed since then and humanity has faithfully climbed the tower and conquered every floor that they had set foot on with the exception of the 51st floor. Jevon's tone became serious as he continued his tale. The Devil's Floor, as many called it, had become the graveyard of countless heroes and renowned warriors that hailed from all parts of the world. It has remained unconquered for a thousand years but today, someone has managed to clear it. Jevon paused before looking at his granddaughter with a complicated gaze. Although he had heard of William's exploits during the war, he still had doubts about his abilities. However, after hearing the divine announcement, 
all of those misgivings disappeared completely. And that someone is your lover, William von Ainsworth. Wendy could feel her face reddening because she felt very proud to be the lover of the only man who managed to do the unimaginable. EST too was feeling very proud. She was very tempted to say that William was her lover too, but in order to not complicate matters, she decided to just keep her feelings inside her heart. However, Jevin wasn't finished with what he wanted to say. He could tell that Wendy was still not aware of how incredible these events were. Wendy, I think you still don't understand the magnitude of what your beloved half-elf has done, Jevin said. Not only did he conquer the 51st floor, he also took the rulership of the other floors of the Tower of Babylon. Jevin's countenance turned extremely serious. This meant that all the families that have reigned for thousands of years were deprived of their rights in a single day and exiled from the Tower of Babylon, never to step inside it again. Do you know what this means? It means that William had made these ruling families his enemies. Wendy answered with uncertainty. Jevin sighed and nodded his head. Indeed. Your lover had made many enemies, but this is only the downside of what he achieved. Right now, William had gained not only one floor, but several floors of the Tower of Babylon. This means that your lover is no longer an ordinary shepherd that everyone can look down on. His status is now equal to one of the emperors in the central continent. An emperor that not only holds vast resources within the Tower of Babylon, but also someone who can build several kingdoms on each floor of the tower that now belong to him. Wendy's jaw dropped because she finally realized the magnitude of what William had attained on his trip to the central continent. EST and Isaac were also enlightened. It was quite unfortunate that both of them couldn't go to the central continent because they had some important things to handle in the Helan kingdom. Wendy was the same. Although she wanted to look for William in the central continent, she still needed to inherit the secret arts of her family. Until she successfully cleared this mission, Jevin and Joaquin would not allow her to set foot in the central continent, and meet the half-elf that was currently in everyone's sights. Back in the Creator Empire Empress Androsta walked towards her temporary residence, along with her entourage. Due to the announcement from the Tower of Babylon, the awarding ceremony had lost all its flair and vigor. Even so, the Amazon Empress didn't put it into heart. In fact, aside from her, several of the sovereigns of the central continent had already made preparations to return to their empires. They didn't want to be the last one to send a delegation to the Tower of Babylon. Their purpose for going to the tower was to make contact with William, and try to negotiate with him for the ownership of the floors that now belonged to him. Also, they wanted to investigate how the half-elf was able to do it. They were even willing to marry their daughters to William in order to have a share of the resources that had now fallen into his grasp. Once a floor had been conquered, they would need to wait for a year before the entrance to that floor was opened again. William would also need to remain in the tower for a month, in order to fully register his ownership for the floors that he had taken by force. Empress Androsta had already sent a message back to her empire, telling her prime minister to send their elite warriors to the Tower of Babylon in order to make contact with William. She was supposed to return, but changed her mind halfway after her attempt to bring Kenneth to her empire failed. Princess Sidney had come to the sleeping elf's rescue when the Amazons were about to carry him out of the arena. Naturally, Lilith stepped in to confront the beautiful princess, but after Princess Sidney said a few words, Lilith, the Amazons, and even Empress Androstet, decided to compromise and give the Creator Princess custody of the sleeping elf. When they heard that Kenneth was actually a messenger by the Saintess of the World Tree, and had a message for William, all of them backed off completely. Right now, William was a hot potato. No one wanted to offend him in any way. This was especially true for the Amazonian race who was very eager to acquire the half-elf's genes. Although Princess Sidney managed to gain custody of her hateful enemy, Lilith still managed to make the Creator Princess promise her one thing. And that promise was for William to have a private meeting with her and Empress Androstet. Naturally, Princess Sidney already had an idea about what Lilith and the Amazon Empress were planning, but she was not afraid. If they only knew how shameless her lover was, 
they would not dare to bring a wolf in sheep's clothing inside their chicken coop. As the Amazon Empress walked the path that led to her residence, she wasn't able to stop the chuckle that escaped her lips. Right now, the entire world was in chaos, and it was all due to a half-elf that had done the impossible. She had long wanted to meet the fabled teenager who had accomplished great things in the southern continent. I hope you're ready, little half-elf. The Amazon Empress glanced at the clear blue sky with great expectations as the smile on her face widened. Meanwhile, high above the Kirinter Mountains, an otherworldly beauty sat on the highest place of Takam's castle. There was a very pleased smile on her face, and her cheeks were slightly red due to the feelings that were welling inside her heart. Seriously, you're such a troublemaker, Ella thought with a smile. It had been a while since she had seen the boy she had raised since he was a baby, and her heart missed him terribly. After a few minutes she gazed at the sky and narrowed her eyes. It won't be the same as last time, Ella said. I will not let you have your way. A giggle filled with amusement answered her words. It was at that moment when a soft and silky voice reached her ears. We'll see about that Amaldaya, the voice said. In the end, the one who will make the choice is him, and not you. A few minutes of silence passed. Ella's gaze never wavered as she looked past the clouds. It didn't take long before her gaze penetrated the Temple of the Ten Thousand Gods. Do not break our agreement. We will do this fair and square, Ella stated. You're not allowed to use your dirty tricks and other underhanded methods to try and sway him. You already know that I can't promise you that, the owner of the voice replied in a teasing manner. The only thing that I can promise is that whatever decision he makes, you have my word that I will respect it. Amaldaya sighed and closed her eyes. She knew that this was the only compromise that her acquaintance would accept. That person doesn't negotiate or bargain. Only on very rare instances would her acquaintance allow exceptions, and William was one of those exceptions. A few minutes later, Ella opened her eyes and asked the person in front of her the question that had been weighing on her heart for a very long time. When will he arrive? Amalthaya's acquaintance didn't answer right away. Instead, it seemed that the person was trying to give Amalthaya the best answer they could give, without breaking the laws that were imposed among gods. Two years, maybe three, the person answered. The current you is not his match. It is a futile endeavor to even try. Ella shifted her gaze and looked at the direction of the central continent. The icy cold wind of the Kirinter Mountains blew past her making her long, light blue hair flutter in the breeze. It doesn't matter if I am not his match or not, Ella replied firmly. I believe in Will. It was also at that moment when a giggle echoed across the Kirinter Mountains. What a coincidence. I, too, believe in Will. His legend is about to begin. End of Volume 4 The Heart Moves Where the Heart Wills Chapter 640 the floor of Asgard. Only a few hours had passed since they had defeated Belial, and both of them were quite exhausted. William received full authority of the 51st floor and was able to transform it according to his will. Soon, the scenery took an amazing change. Belial's crimson world, which was filled with despair, and corruption, was erased completely. It was replaced by the beautiful world that William had seen so many times in his dreams. A world where he stayed after the Valkyrie, Wendy, took him from that bloody battlefield of Midgard. Yes. William had transformed the 51st floor to match his memory of Asgard. After this exhausting task was done, he decided to take Chiffon to the tallest mountain on the floor of Asgard, where he once bathed with his wife, Wendy, on their first meeting in a dream. Big brother, I love you. I love you too, Chiffon. William and Chiffon were soaking in a spring, overlooking the beautiful views around them. However, the half-elf's young bride didn't have much interest in the scenery, and busied herself with kissing William's lips. Chiffon was still inexperienced in the art of kissing, but for William, her kisses were very sweet. Her soft pecks, and clumsy attempts to stick her tongue inside his mouth made the half-elf's love for her burn intensely in his chest. William allowed her to do what she wanted, 
while keeping the flames of passion under his control. He wanted to do this properly, and give Shifun some time to get used to their new relationship. Although their bodies were pressed against each other, William's hands were firmly planted on Shifun's waist, and not wandering around her body. After a good amount of time had passed, Shifun finally pulled back as she panted for breath. Her flushed cheeks, adorable face, and teary eyes, that were filled with love for him, made William's heart melt. Big brother, this is not a dream right? Shifun asked with a hint of anxiety. We really got married, right? William nodded his head before planting a kiss on the pink-haired girl's forehead. This is not a dream, William replied as she held Shifun's right hand and placed it over the gem on his chest. We are officially husband and wife. Perhaps waiting for that moment, the other box that Adephagia had given William, flew out of his storage ring and floated in front of Shifun. A few seconds later, the box opened, revealing a golden ring with runic carvings. This was the matching pair to the ring that William had placed on Shifan's finger during their wedding. Shifan took the ring and reached out for William's left hand. The half-elf had a troubled look on his face, as he allowed Shifan to place the ring on his finger. When the pink-haired girl was about to place the ring on William's ring finger, she noticed that there was already a ring on it. After looking at the ring for a brief moment, Shifan confidently placed the ring on William's thumb. The customs of the dwarves were very different from humans. Instead of placing the ring on their partner's ring finger, they placed it on their thumbs. In the dwarven culture, a thumb ring symbolized freedom, love, and loyalty. Chiffon's mother, April, had no rings on any of her fingers, but her father, Lucille, had a thumb ring. The demon race was against marriage to other races, especially the dwarves. This was also why April and Lucille didn't marry. Instead, Chiffon's mother placed a ring on Lucille's thumb, to express her undying love and loyalty to him. Chiffon had wanted to do the same, so she wasn't too bothered by the ring on William's ring finger. After the ring fixed its size to fit William's thumb, a sweet smile appeared on Chiffon's face. She had been feeling anxious because she thought that she was still inside the dreamscape of the heart devil which had reminded her of things that she had long buried in her heart. Chiffon's smile was like a drug to William. For some stupid reason, he wanted his young bride to only show this smile to him. It was like a treasure that he had fought hard to get, and he didn't want to share it with others. Of course, William didn't voice this opinion out loud. He wanted Chiffon to always be smiling. If he prevented her from doing so, wouldn't the girl just revert to the gloomy self of her past? After having her fill of admiring the ring on William's hand, the ever-eager young bride once again clung to her husband and kissed him passionately. Chiffon was addicted to kisses, and William was more than happy to volunteer himself to be kissed by the pink-haired girl, who loved him with all of her heart. Deep inside, his heart was at peace. He vowed that no matter what happened in the future, he would cherish Chiffon, as well as his other lovers, until he drew his last breath. An hour later, the two finally left the spring and entered the castle of Asgard. It was currently empty, since they were the only two existences on the 51st floor. William didn't regain all of the memories of William Pendragon during his stay in Valhalla. The only thing he remembered were his memories with Wendy, and Chiffon and the War of Ragnarok where everything precious to him was raised by the burning flames of destruction. After walking around the castle for a few minutes, William took Chiffon to the halls of Valhalla. A place where his brother-in-arms had stayed, and feasted whenever they finished a mission. William paused to look at the great seat of honor where Odin, Thor, and the other gods of Asgard dined. They would usually dine with the warriors from time to time and make toasts to them for the great accomplishments that they had done for the safety of the Nine Realms. Big Brother. Chiffon asked. What's wrong? Why are you crying? William touched the side of his face and realized that he was crying. He had many memories of this place, and for some reason, he felt that he had finally come home after a ten thousand year journey. Don't worry. William closed his eyes as he lightly squeezed Chiffon's hand. I'm fine. Just pretend that you didn't see anything just now. 
Un, Chiffon replied as she squeezed back William's hand. William didn't suppress his tears and allowed them to fall freely. For him, this was not a show of weakness, but a form of acceptance. Acceptance for the things that had happened in the past, where he, along with his lovers, comrades, and the Asir, fought with everything they had. And yet, they still failed to prevent the destruction of the world. Chiffon wasn't able to continue watching and hugged William. She wrapped her arms around him and rested her head on his chest. The pink-haired girl wanted to share her love, warmth, and companionship with the person she loved. William, in turn, hugged her back and held her until he no longer had tears to shed. There, in the center of the Hall of Valhalla, where the greatest warriors of the world gathered, alone Ain Herjar, had finally found his way back home.